Um, okay, now, uh, uh, do you want to say something on this plane about the message, or shall I go into introducing the science thing? Maybe let me just say anecdotally that Eric's guru and my guru, but Eric really is his good student, I'm just a convincer, uh, Dr. Nida, he likes very much that people, uh, when we first met, he immediately asked me in one of his own classes, and I was just attending, he said, asked me, would I please talk about inner science, which in the Indian catalog of sciences is considered the supreme science, and actually it sort of is Buddhism, it's called inner science. I mean, they didn't have a, Buddha didn't have a word Buddhism, actually, and he, because he underemphasized his role. He always said, I can't save people. Actually, God told me he couldn't save you. <laughs> he said that to people. He didn't, God didn't tell him that, actually. Brahma, that's the local one. And, uh, and I can't save people, so don't make an ism out of me. But use your own mind according to some methods I've helped you have, because I use mind, if possible. And, and then you can save yourself by developing an understanding of yourself and the world and so on. That's how you have to do it. You can't rely on any other being, including God or any God or me, to save you. You have to do it through your own understanding. And you can. That was what encouraged us. You can do it as human beings. You're incredibly intelligent. You can do it. Don't say, oh, I'm too dumb. Or I'm not educated or whatever. You can. And, but, and, and eventually, in some lifetime or another, you have to, if you want to really escape suffering. He, he taught like that. So this inner science is the, it's sort of, you could say psychology, you could say philosophy, you could say, because in a way, Western modern science has lost its inner science element. It was originally, it had its kind of inner science. Like Newton was very spiritual, and he was, not, he was not in denial of the existence of his own mind, neither was Descartes. But um, lately they are, as the philosopher Thomas Nagel says, all the great Western materialist scientists are sitting around trying to figure out the nature of the world and the universe. And they're starting from a starting point where they're in denial that they personally have minds. <laughs> and every, every measurement they take and everything they do is done by their mind. And their mind is, is there, you know. So what is this, you know? How they expect to explain everything when they're in denial of the, the one thing that's right that is their own face, in a way, actually. But I like that of people. And uh, Henry Stapp, a famous quantum physicist, also told me that, that uh, since 1926, modern science has re-encountered the mind as a force in nature with the Copenhagen Declaration of Quantum Physics about how you can't, your observation of something the observer interferes with the object, so there's no pure objectivity. And therefore, in seeking truth and seeking accuracy and precision, you have to take account through subjective bias and your mental presence. It's part of nature. You can't say it isn't. But they, he said there's been a revolt against that on the part of materialistic scientists. And they've been going off into all kinds of strange theories. He says that. But anyway, the Indians said that from thousands of years ago. And... Um, so they have this inner science, and Dr. Nida wants to, to um, teach the healing science, Soarigma, which is Eric's uh, thing, and his thing, and um, on the basis of its growth from the inner science, from this sort of king or queen of the sciences. Uh, and, and I didn't really realize, it's only since then that I realized why he, I was very surprised, of course I was pleased, and I was very surprised. So, because because even Tibetans sometimes consider them sort of different things, you know. So, but I was pleased because, and but I think I realized his wisdom. Why is that? I have in fifty years of dealing with all of this, I've known many people who are like fed up with surgery or hospitals or you know whatever you know like the food table or all kind of current medicine practice not to mention the pharmaceutical companies and what have you. And, and they, you know, they're into like diet and doing things, yoga and herbal medicine that they like very much. But then when they get diagnosed with leukemia or something, they rush off back to the, 
to the chemo and the whole thing, and they and they just jump for that, and they're terrorized by that diagnosis, and then they they're in the hands of the of the materialist doctors, and um, and who some of whom are very good. I'm not against them really. I'm most against the dogmatism underlying the system, and that's because you know that thing that they say if you could bottle or chemically produce and market the placebo effect, it would be like a miracle drug, right? Because people healing, their mind goes with the healing process, is very, very crucial to the success of any therapy. That's like a sort of well-documented fact, right? So we modern people, including me, when I break some leg or when something happens, you know, serious, I might even be frightened, although I've decided I won't, I will follow Ivan Illich. I had a friend, Ivan Illich, who had a brain tumor, and he refused to deal with it because he was very critical of medicine, and they had a tumor coming out behind his ear, like a big thing like this. He lived 22 years without surgery wow. with that tumor. And then, but he finally died in, his night, in the late 80s or something, of natural causes, but he had an extra piece of head. <laughs> <laughs> and he refused to have his brain cut off because it was too sensitive, he thought. So I, will, I, th I hope I can do that if I get that. I might chicken out, I don't know. But the point is, <laughs> where one's faith and one's sense of confidence is, is affects how well your diet or your yoga or your thing in the long run will help your health or won't help it, actually. So Dr. Nina's wisdom was and is that at least we have to introduce in the potential person who might be interested in herbal medicine or sort of the you know, some new kind of approach to body-mind holistic view, a holistic slash analytic view, um, naturalistic view, uh, to, to at least decide maybe there's some scientific stability, insight, truth there, you know. And maybe, and so to, to a little bit introduce a little doubt about the materialist scientists, like all triumphal, we know everything. And I think actually I'm fairly good at doing that. <laughs> I am. People are shocked with me when I do that. About how I tell the story about the doctor at Bellevue. I wasn't an inmate, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Could happen, but not yet. And, uh, but I was, I was seeing him about a conference we were doing with the Dalai Lama of Dialogue. And he was a neuroscience guy, and he had all his fMRIs and all this stuff, you know, magnetic resonance imaging. And uh, he, uh, and then he was saying about how he really wants Dalai Lama. I said, I don't think Dalai Lama wants to come to your lab. I don't think he does. I said, I'll go, but I'm not anything special. And maybe we could arrange for some yogis to come. And then I said, and you know, there are some yogis who can go into a kind of cataleptic trance. That's where they're barely, not really breathing. And, but they sit still and uh, they don't die. And then their mind is simulating the death experience. I said this to this guy and he went absolutely nuts. And he was a Latino guy, very like vigorous emotionally. And he's like, don't ever say that. Not in this house. We, we know that there's no action after death. There is no death experience. We know that. We've tested it. I've had corpses in my fMRI. There was nothing happening in there. And you know, he went to completely like a small, he lectured me and scolded me in a very quite strong few paragraphs. And I, okay, I'll never bring it up again. I won't say a word. And I was in a shock for like, 13 hours or something. <laughs> and then I, I was driving in a cab back to the west side from that experience in New York. And uh, the driver got nervous because I suddenly burst out laughing <laughs> loudly, thinking about it. Because what I realized is that that doctor scientist, that someone told me, I went to him because they told me he was in line for a Nobel Prize for his fMRI work, those kind of things. So he's supposed to be top line guy. <laughs> He feels that he has discovered nothing and wants a Nobel Prize <laughs> for discovering nothing. <laughs> and then, ever since then, I have really, you know, you really have to think about it. When you speak to a materialist about former and future life, which is very normal, you know, in, uh, in the much of the world, you know, and throughout much of history, when you speak about it, they say, well, what evidence do you have? There's no evidence. You say, well, there's a lot of evidence. There's a lot of documented people remembering previous lives and knowing things about someone in the previous life. They had no other way of knowing it. Huge documentation of that. You can debunk individual cases, but you can't say there's no evidence. 
And that's what I used to just say, and they would just shake their head and like act like nothing. But now then you have to ask them, what evidence do you have that there's nothing after someone dies? Did Carl Sagan report in? <laughs> hey, I don't exist anymore. You're safe from hell. Did he? Has anybody, would anybody ever be able to report it if your thing was correct? So would there ever be evidence? In fact, in principle, there can never be evidence for the existence of nothing. Because actually nothing means it doesn't exist. So you can't go there. But you guys run around thinking you found nothing, and you're sure of it, and it's a scientific fact. Which proves that your notion of a scientific fact is incoherent. <coughs> Do you get it? <coughs> this materialist like E.O. Wilson, brilliant Harvard. <gasps> Tremble because we're in Harvard. <laughs> my, 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 my only teacher once said, it's lucky you went to Harvard, he said to me. I said, what do you mean? He said, even in China, when you hear the word, the word Harvard, they, they tremble. <laughs> so the, I think it was there in the 30s, you know, when they had the Harvard Yenching in, in Beijing. So we're not dealing actually with, we are dealing, with, unfortunately, with rocket scientists, but they're not that bright, actually. They're very crude in their thinking, thinking that nothing is a proven fact. And that that's what your mind essentially is. Like Daniel Dennett, philosophy chair, Terman, I mean, I mean t a tenure at Tufts. He wrote a book about how he was sure that there was no consciousness. It's just a bunch of computer replications in the brain. You know? And that he was sure that Daniel Dennett would not exist after that. And it was proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. It took me three minutes of debate to get him to admit there was a doubt. And yet he asserts that in books and things and writes it like it was like the gospel. So, point is inner science. Now, in that light, what I, what I will talk about, and actually there's a change in schedule tomorrow, the inner science section will be from 4 p.m. and the healing science session will be switched, the mirror kindly switched them, will be in the morning session at 9.45. So, but uh, what I'm going to, in fact, I'm just, I'm just giving you sort of the outline this minute, is the discovery of emptiness slash relativity by Shakyamuni Buddha 2,500 years ago is a scientific discovery. That's, that's my thesis. And I think that's new. Even Buddhists, a lot of Buddhists wouldn't say that. But it is a science. Not, it's not a spiritual discovery. It's not unspiritual. But it's not, a, it's not a sort of mystical thing. It's a discovery in the sense of he experienced that after investigating the nature of reality. And he came to feel for sure that that was the case. And then he could logically argue it, and unassailably, actually, for the last 2,500 years. No one, and uh, he, he predicted that he didn't, in this sutra, that's what he's arguing. And in the various forms of these sutras, these transcendent wisdom sutras, and in sort of a philosophical type text written by a regular human, uh, Nagarjuna, three or four hundred years after Buddha, he wrote the definitive work on wisdom and emptiness consisting of 27 critiques in 27 chapters, like the critique of pure reason sort of thing. And these are scientific, this is a reporting of a scientific discovery preceding Einstein's theory of relativity by 2,500 years approximately. And uh, they, you know, they will argue, oh no, it wasn't science because it's not a material thing, but it is a material thing. It's the nature of matter. Quantum people today have, keep finding that subatomic uh, particles that they find keep themselves dissolving into more and more tiny subatomic particles, and they lose them and they don't know finally whether they're particles or waves. And that's why in 1926 they said, that you can't actually capture the deep nature of reality. It transcends your ability to measure it because your mind interferes with what you're doing at that level. And therefore, you have to leave it as ineffable. And you can only work on the superficial level of reality, the surface level of reality, uh, with a, in, a, in a statistical and probabilistic way to figure out how things are behaving causally so as to be able to interact with them in a creative technological way. That was 1926, they discovered that. And uh, they haven't, nobody's overthrown that yet. They keep building more and more machines, hoping 
to find something that will be the ultimate particle that then their formulas will connect to and then they can control reality by having a formula that connects to an ultimate particle. As, as ancient, as naive physicists and naive people always want to have something in their mind that they think they can control things to feel secure, but in a dualistic conceptual manner. But Buddha's discovery and the quantum physicist's discovery, Einstein himself rebelled against that discovery, actually, but the, the quantum people's discovery was that there is no such thing, and what happens when you analyze reality down to the super micro level, it dissolves under analysis and disappears. Right? And then, but you don't find the, the disappearance either. Because <laughs> that will also disappear. The disappearance will disappear. But I'll talk more about that tomorrow in more detail. But the point is, that was a physical discovery. It's what is there, physical means, you know. And he discovered it with his mind, but he was, had an instrument, which was his brain. And the brain is made of neurons and subatomic particles itself. And he developed a degree of self-awareness and mental stability to get down to the subtle level of the operation of his brain and realize what was going on. And also not finding any piece of the brain, even. Brain disappeared under analysis too. And in a way he maybe realized that, it, that like, like Descartes did, that it's just a thought. But he didn't make it like some naive idealist who they say that it's a thought without there being matter. On some levels there's still matter. But maybe the deepest level of thought is more powerful. Maybe. I think he suggests that. So the deeper levels of Buddhist teaching suggest that. But isn't that matter doesn't exist? It's that it, thought also disappears under analysis. But when they reappear, thought is the, at the subtlest plane. It's easiest to interact with the subtlest plane through thought. So that's one thing. Then second, the next thing is biology. Very important science. And that's the one that Nagel's book was about, called Mind and Cosmos, if anybody's interested in homework on this topic. In his book, Mind and Cosmos, he basically feels that materialistic biology will fail. He's a philosopher at NYU, philosopher of science. It will fail to give an exhaustive description of biological reality because consciousness is a major component of biological reality and they're acting like they're going to reduce that to something else and they're not going to consider it to exist. And he feels that that project is doomed to fail. And he says the reason they're so persistent in that project, although they are aware of its failure, is that they think the only alternative to materialism, scientific materialism, is reversion, reversion to sort of fundamentalist, naive theism. And he says, no, there's a way in which you can bring mind back into it in a pragmatic and scientific manner. He thinks. He doesn't know what it is. He just calls for that, Thomas Nagel does. So I love that because that's calling for the theory of karma. The theory of karma is a biological theory accounting for the different structures of life, the different living forms, the different species. You know, the Darwinian thing that the human and the monkey and everybody and the Galapagos turtle or whatever, they're all interrelated, genetically interrelated forms, uh, is, would not be news to Buddha. But, we've all, but Buddhists, think we're more interrelated to monkeys than Darwin. Because it isn't just our genes. We've all personally been monkeys. Every single one of us has been a monkey many times. And if we're not careful, we will be one again. <laughs> <laughs> and when we try to apply to Harvard as monkeys, we won't, they won't let us in except to the, <laughs> except to the labs. <laughs> and that won't be a nice place to be. So, so, why? Because your mind shapes your biology. And, then, and actually it's a beautiful thing because it connects ethics to evolution. It makes ethics an evolutionary structure or system. And it's really amazing in the Sanskrit language. There's the word kushala and akushala. Ah being the negative, you know, kushala. Which is usually translated as virtue and non-virtue. Or virtue and sin. Kushala, akushala. But... It doesn't mean sin or virtue. What kushala means is skill. So skill or unskillful. And that's something really amazing. Meaning, to kill somebody is unskillful in an evolutionary sense. Or the killer. 
is quite unskillful for the killed, of course, but, but not necessarily, because if they die in a peaceful mood without being angry and hating the person that's killing them, and if they, they can be reborn well from suffering patiently that, that abuse. But the killer is very, very unskillful evolutionarily for the killer, because then they become shut off from the life of that other being by shutting that being off. They draw a boundary, they say, that being's life is not part of my universe. So they narrow their experience of life in the universe. And they, they lower their evolutionary openness, and therefore the, you know, the human being is a valuable being compared to a crocodile or a lion or a horse, because the human being is a more open system, more multiple, programmable, deprogrammable, through thinking of options, opposable thumb, can play around, play the piano, can do different stuff. And those other animals are like more like they only run in one direction. They, you know, they are not. They don't have this this vast openness that we've had. And we, and to get out of having been animals like that, that we've been, we had to be among those lions and tigers. We were the more open one, the least greedy one, the one who would think maybe well, I won't jump on this one. I'll wait, wait for a few weeks. I'm not that hungry yet. Day after tomorrow, I'll have. I'll jump on one or something. You know. So we've, that, that's, that, that's why it's so hard to come up from that lower thing according to the Buddhist biology, because such a being doesn't have the critical self-reflective faculty to the degree the human does to correct or modify consciously their reactions and behavior and instinctual surges and urges, as those animals do. And uh, we still have that limbic set of urges, and, but we are very capable of controlling them, actually, and sublimating them. Which is not just given by nature in Buddha's view, it's the biology of how we came out of lower forms into this form indicates the incredible value of the investment we've made, evolutionary investment, in life and in openness to life and in receptivity to suffering and in, and in em developing empathy, becoming a mammal, having the young inside the body, then being helpless as a young because of a more evolved form, needing the protection of others, being relying on others for protection, etc., the whole human complex is unbelievable. And that brings us very close to the experience of feeling one with the whole universe, that is enlightenment, which is the supreme openness, where you're so open to the other that you feel them, their feelings completely as if they were the same as your own. And in fact, they become your own. They say a Buddha is a being who is like a mother Every other being is like her only beloved child. So for all beings, but it's like that. They, they use that analogy. Okay? So those are, the, those are the key inner sciences. And then psychology, depth psychology, the unconscious, how to deal with the unconscious, how to use mindfulness to get in and figure out how your mind really works and so on. Uh, all of that is, that's the psychological science. So those are, the, that's, that's, that's it. Those are, that's my side of it. And, um, uh, I'm going to do that in more detail at 4 p.m. and uh, everybody